In this brief video, we will discuss the topic of ethics and consider a definition of ethics. Then we will move on and discuss how ethics in different professions may relate to ethics in mentoring. Ethics is a word that we hear often, but it can be a more challenging word to actually define. In the past, I've asked students to define this word and typically they will identify that the word ethics refers to parameters that govern behavior or guidelines for how to act. I would encourage you to take a moment and just consider how you would typically define this word and then consider whether this definition from Blackburn, which is ideas on how to live, what we find acceptable or unacceptable, determines our conception of when things are going well and they are going badly, gives us our standards, our standards of behavior, aligns with some of your ideas. This will be the way that I will consider ethics for the duration of this presentation. Like we've already identified, there is no code of ethics that is specific to mentoring. This is largely because mentoring is not a profession and instead is volunteer driven. Moreover, mentoring is a broad activity and varies widely across settings and geographic locations. Because there's no formal code of ethics for mentoring, it's helpful to consider how mentoring relates to different professions and then consider how to use the ethical principles from these professions to guide ethical behavior in the context of a mentoring relationship. Two professions that tie into mentoring are psychology and teaching. The assigned article nicely highlights how therapy and mentoring share similarities. And of course, teaching and mentoring are connected as both involve a fundamental relationship component and the transmission of knowledge. Let's take a closer look at how these different professions approach ethics. Psychologists ascribe to a code of ethics put forth by their respective psychological associations. In Canada, this would be the Canadian Psychological Association or CPA, and in the US, it is the American Psychological Association or APA. Although the codes of ethics for each vary slightly, they are both based on a series of foundational ethical principles. These include autonomy, non-maleficence and beneficence, fidelity, justice, and integrity. A definition of each of these words can be found in the CPA and APA codes of ethics. And in addition, Dr. Derek Truscott and Kenneth Crook also discuss several of these principles in their book, Ethics for the Practice of Psychology in Canada, which I will be quoting. So first, Truscott and Crook say that autonomy refers to the right to make choices about self-determination and to have freedom from the control of others. For example, clients have the right to decide whether or not to participate in psychology services. Truscott and Crook also note that non-maleficence means not causing harm to others or not inflicting intentional harm nor engaging in actions that risk harming others as well as being obligated to protect clients against harm. Meanwhile, they note that beneficence refers to actively contributing to the well-being of others, providing aid to those that are in need of assistance. In other words, with these two principles, psychologists are required to benefit their clients' well-being, or at the very least, to do no harm to their clients. According to Truscott and Crook, fidelity refers to loyalty, honesty, and trustworthiness. Naturally, this includes placing the needs of our clients ahead of our own. Truscott and Crook note that justice refers to our ethical obligation to act fairly, to avoid bias or unfair discrimination. And finally, integrity refers to, refers to our obligation to be open, honest, accurate, and straightforward in our relationships with our clients, to maximize objectivity and minimize bias. Can you see where there's a connection between psychology and mentoring? Certainly, ethics in psychology and ethics in mentoring have overlap. The main connection is that both psychology and mentoring are relationship dri driven, and typically the relationship is focused on one party, such as the mentee or the client. The main focus in both is also to benefit the receiving party, whether that be the mentee or the client. Finally, there is a power differential in both relationships. 
In a psychologist-client relationship, the psychologist naturally carries more power, while in a mentor-mentee relationship, the mentor naturally carries more power. Thus, considering the ethical principles driving the psychologist-client relationship is of importance when considering the ethical principles behind the mentor-mentee relationship. In their book, The Ethics of Teaching, Strike and Soltz Soltis identify that ethics and education can be considered from two perspectives, including the consequentialist perspective and the non-consequentialist perspective. Consequentialist theories focus on benefit maximization. In other words, Strike and Soltis state that consequentialist theories suggest that the rightness or wrongness of an action is decided in terms of its consequences, and thus the focus is benefit maximization. These authors state that, according to consequentialist theories, whenever we are faced with a choice, the best and most just decision is the one that results in the most good or the greatest benefit for the most people. Alternately, Strike and Soltis share that non-consequentialist theories say that the rightness or wrongness of an action is based on properties intrinsic to the action, not on its consequences. Thus, the focus is on equal respect for all persons. Non-consequentialist theories incorporate moral rights and in essence refer back to the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Thus, when it comes to making a decision, the best decision is one that is moral and considers the welfare of all people. Let's look at an example. So let's say that in order to benefit the learning of the entire class, five kids were asked to leave the class so that the teacher could more closely assist with the other 15 students. This would be acceptable from a consequentialist perspective because despite the harm to the five expelled children, 15 are being benefited. Therefore, the greatest benefit is being provided to the most people. However, from a moral and non-consequentialist non perspective, this would be unethical because the five children did nothing wrong to be expelled and it's unfair that they are being asked to leave the class. Although this example is somewhat abstract, it highlights a difficulty that school administrators commonly face. Whether to adhere to moral rights or whether to focus on the greatest benefit for the greatest number of people. Can you see where there's a connection between teaching and mentoring? Certainly, like psychology, ethics and teaching and ethics and mentoring have overlap. Again, teaching, like mentoring, is a very relationship-oriented profession and one where there is a stark power differential. In addition, like teaching, mentoring often involves the formal and informal transmission of information. Finally, there's also a behavioral modeling component in both teaching and mentoring that is central for children. In his book, Dr. Derek Truscott and his co-author Kenneth Crook highlight the differences between a code of ethics, code of conduct, and set of guidelines. I would encourage you to take a moment to consider these definitions. The important difference between codes of, ethic, codes of ethics and codes of conduct are the standards of behavior they define. Codes of ethics are aspirational in nature, and they define the highest, most desirable behaviors while codes of conduct set the minimum standard for behavior. One should always be striving to behave in a way that is ethical, but at the very least should not violate the code of conduct. Finally, Truscott and Crook note that guidelines really serve as the bridge between ethics and conduct and guide behavior in areas that are of concern to all. Typically, it's guidelines that are used in mentoring agencies.